Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to start this uh, lesson off. Uh, this is the second part of a three-part series on Pentecost, um, or we could say a confirmation, personal Pentecost. And I'd like to go ahead and start off with the prayer to the Holy Spirit, which is on uh, page 19 of the Oratory Place of Prayer book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in the previous um, lesson on, on Pentecost or Confirmation, we, talked, we just looked at uh, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but also where the Holy Spirit has been um, really throughout salvation history, going back actually to the very first day, the second verse in the Bible. And so I think it's important first just to kind of talk about what is Pentecost, what does that mean? Um, uh, the word Pentecost, um, that, that, sorry. Um, the word Pentecost really just it means 50th day. And in the, in the Jewish faith, um, they celebrated uh, the, the Pasch, right, the Passover, and, and they also celebrated Pentecost. So if you were coming to Jerusalem for the Passover, you would have stayed um, for, for the, the Feast of the Pentecost. Um, what, to the Jewish person, what was the, the, the Pasch, what was that um, remembering? It was remembering the Passover of Moses, right? So when, when the um, Jewish people were captive um, by Pharaoh, that they had the Passover meal, that uh, the angel of death passed over them because they put the blood of the, bl of the unblemished lamb on their doorpost, and then they were able to escape and then uh, go through the Red Sea. So we have this, um, this escape from Egypt, from their captivity, and then uh, going through the Red Sea. Um, and, then, and then what happened as they wandered on the 50th day, uh, what took place is, is the Ten Commandments. So it's, a, it's actually such a great feast for the Jewish people that they can celebrate their release from captivity but also um, the great gift of, of the law that was given to them, that um, they just didn't have to wander around, but they were given direction, that they were given the law. Um, so tremendous feast days here for the Jewish people. Um, and this is all a part of God's plan, because now we see that, that what will happen is when God perfectly reveals himself through the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, that, that the Pasch now will happen, uh, it'll take on Jesus' life, we'll have his passion, his death, and his resurrection. So during the Passover meal, he'll have the Last Supper, and we have now the, the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then what's going to happen, um, and, and this, it's important to note that this passion, death, and resurrection is, is the, the most perfect manifestation of the Son. Jesus says, I am the Son of God, but how does he prove that? How does he back that up? By, by rising from the dead. Um, so not only did he say that he was God, but he was able to back that up. So this is the manifestation of the Father. Or, I'm sorry, of the Son. And then just as for the Jewish people, they had the escape from, from their, their slavery, and then the great gift of the law, now we have the, the we have been held captive by sin. We have now through the passion, death, of resurrection, Jesus has conquered sin. And when we die with him and live with him, 
um, then we also are able to conquer sin through him. And so this manifestation of the Son is not just a manifestation of the Son, but it's also the uh, fulfillment of the Passover. It's the fulfillment of the, the Egypt and, and Red Sea, because now we have conquered sin. And now what happens, this great gift is given to us, Pentecost, all right? The coming of the Holy Spirit, or the descent of the Holy Spirit. So this now, if this is the perfect manifestation of the Son, the Passion, Death, and Resurrection, well now, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, we have the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And then we want to look really at, um, let's go ahead and look at John's Gospel, and this is the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, that um, he will say, um, so this is uh, John 14, this is the promise of the Holy Spirit, John, John 14, 15. Um, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with, with you and will be with you. Um, and so, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And here's the thing, the commandments have been given, right? But the commandments cannot be followed without love. Um, here, really, it becomes just a law, just a legalistic law. But, but how can we really accomplish the law? I guess there's a few reasons why we would obey a law. Um, we would obey a law out of fear, um, fear of a punishment, which definitely could happen here. I have given you this law. If you don't obey it, you will be punished. Um, you could also obey a law out of a reward. If you obey these laws, I will give you such and such. I will give you the promised land. Um, if you don't obey the law, you will be conquered by your enemies. So there, there would be the motivation to follow the law. It could be out of fear. It could be out of reward. But the, the perfect motivation is always love. How can we accomplish the law? Out of love. And so sometimes when we see that the precepts of the church can be challenging, we have to ask ourselves, do we have love? If, if I have a hard time with the church's teaching on, on uh, you know, no contraception, if I have a, 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 any of the moral teachings, whether it be extramarital um, relations, you know, sexual relations outside of marriage, um, going to Mass on Sunday, um, prayer, all of these, these things, these precepts of the church, these commands of God, when we th see things like love your enemies, pray for your enemies, um, all of these precepts, how can we accomplish them without love? We can't. So if we have a hard time accomplishing the law, we have to ask, do we have love? Do we need greater love? Uh, this verse is perfect because, you know, um, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And Jesus gives us the love. When does he give us the love? He gives us the love with the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So you can see how not only does the passion, death, and resurrection fulfill the, the, um, the or, or was foreshadowed with Egypt and the Red Sea, but now we see that the coming of the Holy Spirit enables us. Our Pentecost confirmation, this gift of the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit alive and active in our life that allows us to love, that will allow us to obey the commandments of God. Um, and, and this is why it's, uh, I guess it's such a serious sin to, to, um, to sin against the Holy Spirit. Because a sin against the Holy Spirit is really a sin against love. Everything has been manifested to us. So I, I want to take us to that verse where Jesus does say that um, all sins will be forgiven, but the sin that won't be forgiven is a sin against the Holy Spirit. So this is in Matthew 12, um, and this is 31. Matthew 12, 31. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. Now why is this? Why is it that someone can sin against the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, but then if they sin against the Holy Spirit, it's unforgivable. 
Um, we have to think about, especially what we talked about in the first lesson, that the manifestation has now been complete. Jesus, son, Jesus Christ was manifested, his passion, death, and resurrection. But even the night of his resurrection, it said that even after he had risen and appeared to the disciples, they still lacked the faith. They still had doubt. They had questions arising in their heart. So even though Jesus had been manifested through the passion, death, and resurrection, it, they still didn't understand. Why didn't they understand? Because the Spirit had not been given yet. And the Spirit would teach them all things. This is exactly what it says in John, which we just read. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Um, and so, what helps us to understand the manifestation of the Son is the Holy Spirit. So now that the Holy Spirit has been given at Pentecost, there is no excuse. The Father has been revealed, the Son has been revealed, and the Holy Spirit has been revealed. We have been given everything now to sin against that is to sin against the perfect, complete, total revelation of God. And, and, it's, and it really is a sin against love, because love has been given. Um, it, you know, and, and another thing we say with that is, when we just say that that's not good enough, you know, um, that my sin or myself or my pride is, is, is more important than all of that. You know, that's a grave sin, a sin against the Holy Spirit. Um, so... With, with all of that, we need, we, we see this great gift, the, the gift of the Son, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit enables us to, to if you love me, you will keep my commands. Um, so that we, we actually live what we believe. But we can't live out what we believe without the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, a few more things to think about with Pentecost. And we can uh, just, once again, uh, let, let's look at the figures of both Moses and Peter. Moses is really the dominant figure um, in, in the whole story of Egypt, and the crossing of the Red Sea, the gifts of the, um, of the Ten Commandments, the gift of the law. Um, but but what, what do we see, who is the predominant figure then in Acts of the Apostles? It becomes Peter. And a perfect example of this is when the um, apostles are together, Jesus has just ascended to the Father. And remember, there's just a small gap there, that 10-day that, uh, window or that 9-day window, where the apostles are praying together, waiting, as Jesus said, wait in the city until the power from on high is, is, is you are clothed with the power on high. And so we see that Jesus has just ascended to the Father, and the apostles, the disciples, they're all gathered in the upper room, and... Um, there's a problem because there's only 11 apostles. And it's not fitting that there would be 11. There needs to be 12. There have been the 12 tribes of Judah. And so for this to be complete, there needs to be another apostle that is chosen. And the apostle must be someone that has witnessed the whole life of Christ. And so who is it that makes this decision? Jesus has now ascended to the Father, so he's not going to make the decision. So there needs to be someone to stand out and make this decision. And we see that as Peter. So Peter, now, after Jesus has ascended to the Father, uh, takes the role of the vicar. He takes the role of the vicar of Christ. Um, and, we, and we see this happening um, in the Acts of the Apostles. So we have the old Pentecost. Moses is the, is the figure. And in the new Pentecost, Peter becomes the dominant figure. Um, we see that in, in the old one, um, Moses, Moses, when he gets the law that it's written on tablets. So, the law is written on stone. Tablets. This new law, which is a law of love, is written on the heart. Okay, so there's a lot of simili similarities here. Uh, if you remember, you've probably seen videos of this or movies. Um, when, when, when Moses goes up the mountain, to, uh, to meet, um, this is also kind of a neat thing, Moses goes up the mountain, right, and then brings down the law, and Jesus ascends to the Father, and then brings down to the Holy Spirit, so there's a lot of different correlations there, but, but when Moses ascends the mountain, it, it, it's a very cloudy, um, kind of scary um, picture where there's lightning and rain and, and dark clouds, 
and, uh, and, and no one really knows, oh, man, is he going to come back? What's going on? Um, and so we have um, basically a cloudy, a cloudy day. Um, it's, it's overcast. But when Peter, um, when, the, when Pentecost occurs, it's a clear day. Very clear. In other words, there's just not, no fear involved. Um, here, everyone is struck with fear. Here, when there's this descent of the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire that come down, um, we, we have uh, that there's not, there's not fear, but instead peace. On, um, when, when we talk about this, this old law, uh, we talk about a sense of, of justice, right? And fear, once again. Um, here we have a sense of mercy and love. So with all of these, we see that there's definitely something happening, that, that God is, is, is perfecting um, what has happened, that this is a, 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 a type of what's going to happen with the church. This is uh, really the birth, the identity of the Israel nation as they move into the promised land. This is the birth of the church. Uh, you know, this is when the church will now move into the world and prepare all, everyone, all pilgrims, for their destination to heaven. Um, a few things that happen... Um, in the Old Testament, this is kind of a side, not really dealing with Moses, but we have the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel is when the people had come together. They were all speaking the same language. And in speaking the same language, they used their common language to, to go against God. Um, and, and to, in a sense, challenge God. So they used their unity to challenge God. Um, because of that, they, um, the, the justice that was given in this was that they, um, they were, the, the languages were confused. So they were confused, and they spoke different languages. They didn't understand each other, I guess. There's no understanding. No comprehension of what they're saying. On the other end, uh, when, we, when we see the tongues of fire come down, and this is important because when the tongues of fire hover over, over the, the people in the room, um, each, each tongue of fire comes individually over each person's head. It's not a big fireball, in a sense, that covers like an umbrella, but instead each person is individually given this gift and given the particular gifts that they need. Now, what happens with this tongue is beautiful. We'll talk about this in the third lesson, is that when, when, the, when Peter goes out to preach, and this is the same thing of the other apostles, when he preaches... Everyone hears him in their own tongue. So it's just like if I were, I am giving this, this talk right now in English, but if, if, you were, if you were from France, maybe you would hear it in French perfectly. I don't speak French, but they would hear it in French with a perfect accent. Um, same thing if you lived in Spain, then you would hear this video in Spanish with, with a perfect accent. And that's the miracle that took place. The reason God allowed that to happen was, was kind of a reversal, it is a reversal of what happened at Babel, where justice was given here um, because people had used their unity to challenge God, then justice was given and they were confused because it wasn't good for them to challenge God. That was going to destroy them, so God gave them the justice, a punishment that would basically try to save them, um, that they would, be, they would be confused by each other. Well, here he's going to give us this mercy, Okay, the mercy of, of being able to communicate. Um, they are now able to communicate. Um, and with this, then, they're able to, to hear each other. And where here, you have that they, their unity went against God. Now, the unity of the apostles and all those that hear them will be for God. Here, they were trying to build a tower uh, build build something that would challenge God. Here, um, in, the, in the new, after Pentecost, they're going to be building the city of God. They're going to be building a tower for all humanity to get to heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.